Good evening, and I want to begin by telling you how excited I am to be here tonight, and I want to thank the students who invited me to come. When I was preparing to graduate from college, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with my life, but at the point that I was graduating, I knew that I wanted to embark on something that would help me continue my education and at the same time enable me to find a way to be of service. What I decided to do is I decided to apply to the Peace Corps. Um, the Peace Corps is an American agency which sends young men and women um, with skills to countries who request those skills. What I did is I, when I interviewed with them, they talked with me about what my experiences had been and they decided to offer me a position as a math education volunteer. This was something I was really excited to do. What I had to do was wait to find out where it is that they would invite me to perform my service. After a few months, I received a fat envelope in the mail and in this envelope, it informed me that I was being invited to serve in the country of Guinea. And at the time that I received the letter, I have to admit, I didn't know where Guinea was located. And the first thing I did was pull out an atlas. This was before the internet. And I took a look to find out where Guinea is. And you can see it on the map over there, the arrow pointing to it. It's on the west coast of Africa. It's a former French colony, so the language of, uh, of the people there is French. And so I was thrilled. Um, I had studied a very little bit of French in college, and I really wanted the opportunity to learn to speak another language, and I wanted to visit and live within a culture that was completely different than our American culture. So my journey began in July after I graduated. Six weeks after I graduated, I was on a plane. I flew overseas, and I first went to the country of Senegal, which borders Guinea to the north. And I spent two months there in training. And my training was threefold. The first part was language immersion. As I mentioned, I'd only had a little bit of French in college, and so I spent six hours a day with a Southern Belize instructor and with fellow Peace Corps volunteers to learn French enough so that I could interact with individuals on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as be able to teach a class of math. The second aspect of my training was vocational training. So I had not done my undergraduate degree in education. I was a liberal arts major, and so I had to have a crash course in what it would be to teach in a school in Guinea. I went into a public school and they followed the French system of education there. And then the third element of training was acculturation. So they had to prepare me for what life was going to be like in Guinea because it was nothing like anything we experienced here in the United States. And that in some ways was the most important part of the training that I had. Upon the completion of my training, I was sworn in as a volunteer. And I wanted to include the oath that I took as a volunteer. Um, at the time, it was very, very meaningful to me. Let me read it to you. I, Mary, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter. This was a weighty oath to take, and to be honest, I didn't, wasn't aware when I was looking at the Peace Corps that I would be taking this oath. And on the day that we were sworn in, it was the ambassador of the Guinea who had us um, swear in. And he told us in that ceremony that we would be ambassadors, that his job was made much easier by the fact that we as Americans were out in the villages and the small towns of Guinea, places where he could not reach, and that we would all be expected to act as representatives of our country while we were um, engaging in our service. So off I went. This is a picture of me on the road near my village. And as you can see, I'm wearing traditional Ghanaian wear at that time. One of the pieces of our training, I mentioned culturation, is really, really important. And one of the aspects of going to Guinea was understanding that Guinea was a country that where 85% of the population was Muslim. And so that required that the clothing that I wore reflected the values of the people where I lived. And so one of those values is the fact that as a woman, it would be considered unseemly or immodest if I were to show, for example, my leg above my knee. So all of the clothing that I wore always made sure that I dressed and long skirts like you see what I was wearing in the picture. But at the same time, there was no concern about arms showing. So for example, I frequently wore tank tops kind of like I'm doing right now and I didn't need to cover my hair as well. The requirements for women were actually very similar to the requirements for men. Uh, men also never wore shorts. And in fact, it was considered unseemly for an adult male or female to wear shorts. Men and women wore pants or they wore skirts. And as an American, it was a little bit difficult because it was hot and there were days where I wanted to wear shorts. But I felt that if I didn't, I would be perceived by those around me as not being someone who was dignified or worthy of respect. And so it was important to me that I understood the viewpoint of the people with whom I was living, so that if they were going to hear me and understand who I was, at the same time I needed to respect their, their culture as well. 
Um, oftentimes when I tell people about my Peace Corps experience, they want to know what it was like and where I lived. And the hut that you see here is actually not the hut that I lived in. My, my dwelling was a little bit different, but I was often envious of the volunteers who got to live in such a dwelling. Um, Guinea is hot. It's only 400 miles north of the equator. There are two seasons. It's hot. Or basically, it's the dry season or the wet season, and it's always hot. Um, the mud hut that you see here with the thatch roof is actually a really cool dwelling place. So if you think about it in your own home, if you go down into the basement where it's partially underground, it's kind of like being within mud walls. And so one of the things that I really began to appreciate when I lived there was how they use their environment to make themselves more comfortable. And the fact that what we might see as a modern convenience might be better to live in a house with air conditioning, for example. They found ways to, to be cool and to live and, and comfortable. Um, clearly, living in a, a house like this indicates that there was no running water, there was no electricity. And this is something that I understood that I was going to experience when I went there. And I wasn't particularly fearful of it. But again, at the same time, people often wonder, hmm, how do you live without running water? That means no plumbing. How do you live without electricity? That's no lights. And well, the next slide sort of speaks for itself. <laughs> right? You learn very quickly to adapt to the circumstances that you're in. And oftentimes, what you think is going to be the scariest and most uncomfortable situations you discover, I can adapt. Um, in fact, th there's nothing really that difficult to adapt to. One of the things that impressed me about the Guinean people was how hard they worked. And as a woman in Guinea, I became very intrigued with the roles of women in the country where I, I was. And, and women in Guinea are some of the hardest working people I've seen anywhere. Um, because they lack basic in public infrastructure like we have, like running water and electricity, the, the burden of household duties do fall on the women. And fetching water, for example, daily is a chore. Uh, fetching firewood in order to, to cook for the family is important. And one of the difficulties that I had is, of course, I didn't have running water in my house either. And there was a pump about 50 meters from my house that I would have to walk to to get water. And I, I mentioned before about dress and having appropriate dress. Well, there were also appropriate behaviors for how I was supposed to act as not only a a teacher, and a teacher was considered a valued member of the society, of the community, but how are you supposed to act as an adult woman? And adult women do not pump water. Pumping water is, is child's work. And when I mean child's work, I mean the work of six and seven year olds. So when I would go to the pump to get water, because in my mind that was my responsibility to provide myself with that service, I would find six and seven year old girls there, and they didn't want me to pump water. They would pump it themselves, and they would take these huge five gallon, 10 gallon drums, and they would lift it and put it on their heads, and they would want to walk it home. And I was constantly having a, a struggle within myself. Do I allow children to do this? Do I do it myself? Sometimes I did it myself. Sometimes I let the children do it. Uh, it you know, as a Peace Corps volunteer and as someone who is living in a different culture, finding a way to respect <coughs> their values and at the same time respect my own values and what was important to me was always a daily struggle. In this picture, I wonder if you can see where I am. <laughs> right? Bote. Right? I am clearly a very fair-skinned American, and wherever I went in Africa, I stood out. And there's a special name for white foreigner in the local language, the local language was Susu, and it was Foteg. So anywhere I went, hordes of children, I always felt like there were hordes of them, dozens of children were always playing. The minute they would see me, because obviously I stand out, they would holler, Foteg, 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 Foteg. And what they were doing is they were waiting for me to say, Bonjour, ça va? And when I did that, they'd get excited, and they'd run around, and they'd come up, and they'd want to shake my hand. Every time I left my home, every single time I left my home, people would holler, Bote, Bote, Bote. Initially, it was kind of cool. I felt sort of like a rock star. I thought, everybody loves the American. This is really great. But after months and months and months of constantly being called Bote, there was a certain grading that occurred. And again, it was a cultural dissonance that was happening. For them, there was no disrespect in calling me Fote. They were simply saying, you're a foreigner, right? And, and I was a foreigner. But I'm coming from the US. And in the US, we all know that it's completely inappropriate to call out and holler at somebody based on their race or ethnicity. It was really difficult. And so I would have to talk myself down and say, they're not trying to be rude. They're not saying anything bad about me because I'm fair skinned. And at the same time, it was difficult. It was a really difficult experience. It was a great opportunity for me to experience what it's like to be different. I show a picture here of the market, because when I would go to the market, that's where the, the sellers of, of various goods would often say, hey, Bote, they wanted me to come over and purchase goods from them. And part of, again, the culture of Guinea is when you go to purchase something, you'll notice there are no price tags. Okay, You never know how much something costs. 
So when you go to the market, it's all about bargaining and determining what the cost might be. Whenever I, as a pote, as a white foreigner, was walking into a market, market, any price that was stated for me was always four to five times higher than what the other people's prices would be. And that was okay. I had more money, and so that was sort of expected. But I was not expected to pay that price the four or five times more what they had. I was expected to barter, barter, and I was expected to engage in a conversation. So here in the United States, we like to run to the store. We run in, we run out. We're hoping that the lines are really quick, that no one's going to hold us up. You're expected to have a conversation. The conversation never begins with, how much does that cost? The conversation always begins with, hi, how are you doing? How's your mom? How's your dad? How's your spouse? How are your kids? What are you doing tonight? What did you do yesterday? Things are good. Yeah. So what do you think about that uh, piece of cloth over there? How much do you think it is? Oh, you think your mom would like it? You think your dad would like it? Mm -hmm. What about your sister? And so it's always a conversation, like a 20-minute conversation. This was like agonizing. And again, as an American, the last thing you want to do, really, at least I wanted to do, was barter. I just wanted to know, how much does it cost? Let me pay it and get out of here. But I learned that that was rude. And I had to stop and I had to talk. And that was part of making connection. And it really became a lot of fun. Um, I have to admit, there was one time when I was in uh, the capital of Conakry, and I, I was bar bartering, again, for some cloth at one point. And it was, it was a long exchange. At the very end of it, when I finally got the deal that I wanted, the gentleman said to me, ma'am, you're hard. And at that point, it was the best, best compliment I got the entire time I was there, because it meant that I had learned how to bargain. So one of the things about living abroad is there comes a point when you are not shocked by anything anymore. So all the things that seemed really different to you while you were there suddenly aren't that different anymore. Um, this is a picture of a taxi Bruce. Um, when you are traveling in Guinea, you always have to travel by taxi. <coughs> there are no individual cars. Individuals don't own cars. Um, you, you, you travel together. So you go to the taxi station, and there's no particular taxi leaving at 11 o'clock. So if you show up at whatever time, you have to wait until the taxi is full before it takes off, which could be all day. It could be until the next day. You never know how long you're going to be waiting for the next ride to get yourself to the town. And what you'll notice, of course, are all the things that are piled on top. It was completely normal. Okay, the first time I saw it, I thought, you know, how can that be safe? And the gentleman hanging off the back, that's nothing. Half the time, they had things like goats and chickens hanging off the back that they strapped on. And again, all I could ever think was, oh my goodness, if the people at PETA ever saw this, they'd never allow it, right? But in Guinea, that's just the way things were done. When I finished my assignment, I came home, and I was really excited to come back to the United States. I actually came to New York City after I was in West Africa, and I'm not a native New Yorker, um, but I am an East Coaster. When I came back to New York, I was really excited to be anonymous. Um, I was excited to be able to walk down the street and for nobody to care who I was or what I was doing. I didn't have to represent the United States or behave in any particular way. I, like I said, I was completely anonymous. But at the same time, there were certain things that I came back that I realized Things that I thought that I would enjoy, I didn't enjoy quite so much anymore. So, for example, the supermarket. It took me a solid year before I was comfortable going to a regular grocery store because there was too much to choose from. I didn't know where to start, and I was completely overwhelmed. In the markets in Guinea, you had no choices. It was always like three or four things. Whatever happened to be in the harvest, that's what you ate, that's what you bought. Coming back to the U.S., I didn't know what to do with the supermarkets. The other thing is when I was in Guinea, there was a lot of talk about how wealthy Americans were. And as a recent college graduate, saddled with college loans, I was making $180 a month as a Peace Corps volunteer. I didn't feel like I had a lot of money. And so this conception that I was somehow wealthy to me seemed laughable. When I came back to the United States and just driving from the airport on the highway, seeing all the incredibly shiny cars as compared to what I had seen in Guinea, my first thought was, my God, they're right, we're wealthy. I had no idea until I had gone somewhere else and came back and saw it from very, very different eyes. What I discovered while I was there is that perspective is something that shifts based on where you are. Um, if you've ever had the experience of going to the beach and you put your towel and you put your umbrella on the sand and then you wade out into the water and you're swimming and you're enjoying yourself, and at some point you stop and you look back to see where your beach umbrella and towel are and it's not there, right? And you realize that it's way down the other side of the beach and that you've been swept slowly aside by, by the current to another portion of the beach. That's what happens when you travel somewhere else and you live among the people, and you live among the culture, you begin to realize that your perspective has completely shifted, and what you were expecting to see, you're no longer going to see. I know that there are a lot of seniors who are in um, the audience tonight, and you're gonna be graduating soon, and you'll be heading off to college. And as you go to college, you're gonna have the opportunity to be in a completely different environment where your perspective and your assumptions about life are going to be challenged. 
It's a fabulous journey. You don't need to go to West Africa or Guinea to have your perspective reshaped. When you simply put yourself into positions that make you uncomfortable, it will happen.